I've been continuing to test things out that sell online, but haven't decided on a cart yet. So far, hired a person to start helping us do the floors and the ceiling. All the intern applications are in and set up some times to interview people. While I've been thinking of things to sell, here's a weird thing I figured out. Dollar Trees are a really great place to look for ideas. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. The person I meet today is based out of Illinois. He actually messaged me last season to say that he appreciated the show. Chris Prunkle, and I do a webcomic called Wanna Be the Comic. After he sent me the message, of course, I went and looked at the stuff that he does, and I was intrigued by the comic that he does called Wanna Be the Comic, which is kind of a music review comic strip. I've been doing it for probably about, geez, four or five years now, which it doesn't seem that long, but as I'm actually putting the number to it, it's probably about four or five years now that I actually... Uh, partnered with a buddy a conversation that uh, I've been doing a version of wannabe for two years before that. The first year was actually about uh, the voices in my head and the responsible voice in my head and the creative voice in my head, them battling each other. Basically, I was raised in a household that wanted me to get a normal job, a good college education and go the route of the businessman. And there was the passion I had where I wanted to be an artist and I, I desperately wanted to go to an art school and follow the art path. And so because of that, and because of the way I was kind of raised, I, I had these dueling voices in my head. So that was the whole first year, but that kind of was wayward and it wasn't really following a path. So went from there to the second year I work at my, my day job in advertising. The second year was all about advertising, kind of the nonsense that goes on within the advertising world and some of the ridiculous things that you come across over your time there. What I noticed is after a, about a year of that, I was just really negative and it was just something I didn't want to do. And I, I was kind of just at a, a crossroads where I'm like, okay, do I really want to do this anymore? I've been doing this web comic. Is this really, you know, could I concentrate on something better, more positive and was ready to walk away. And I was talking to a buddy of mine from a band two cow garage, which I'm a huge fan of out of, out of Ohio. We we're just shooting the shit after a concert and, it came up about the comic and I had done one comic where even though it was talking about advertising, I think I was talking about how tired I was the next day after going to a show. And I mentioned to God garage. And how I thought more people should know them and how much I love them as a band. It did phenomenally well. They were great about it. They were posting it. They loved it. And so he brought me, he's like, why don't you make it about music? If it, that did really well. And I'm like, ah, I don't know how I can make it work. Uh, it, it seems like a stretch, you know, it's only six panels. How do I talk about music in six panels? I, I toyed with things a bit and it was trying some different things. I tried interviews. I tried doing it where I, I was talking about a specific song or things like that. And what I ended up doing was uh, finding that uh, talking about albums in six panels, which is what the comic is. It's always six panels. worked out really well. And what it was is we are in a age of people with very short attention spans and not willing to sit with things very long. I, I found that, you know, I, I could boil down talking about an album to this really concise. And even from that, I, I boil it down to four panels where I'm actually talking about the music. First panel is always lyrics. Last panel is always lyrics. And there's these four panels where I'm just explaining why I like it. And that's very important to me. I always yeah. talk about why I like the album. I don't talk about things I don't like. I, it's always something I'm, I'm passionate about. I, I wanted to make sure it was something I liked. I'm older. I, I just turned 40 two weeks ago. So it's hard when you get older to find music and talk about music and get the, in those discussions that when you were in college, you took for granted. It was kind of a way for me to put on social media, the music I was really enjoying mm -hmm. and actually go and put it out there. And then other people finding it too, and having conversations back and forth. It's, it's been a complete blast. I love doing it. What made you even go, I'm going to start posting this online, even when it was originally what it was before it evolved. I was contacted by a local Chicago publishing company that wanted to produce some web content, something to get people and drive people to their site. And so they have reached out to me because a buddy knew a buddy and you know how that goes with friends meet okay. friends. They were looking for an idea, just something to put up there. Originally, I tried to do a story that was going week to week. Yeah. It was this idea called Asylum Doors. And it was about a woman who um, could read minds, 
that thought she was going crazy. She couldn't control her powers. Basically, she had tried to stop a murder. And because she knew all these details, the police thought she was guilty. And they locked her up in a mental institution. I thought, what would be the creepiest thing about somebody who can read other minds? Well, if she was locked up with people who are legitimately crazy and she's hearing and these stories are just bombarding her. So I, I thought that was, was really cool. And I, I still do like the idea, but if it, it just wasn't carrying week to week. And so it was coming out every Wednesday, which even Wannabe still to this day comes out every Wednesday. I was just finding that people were getting confused and the navigation on this publishing company site wasn't great for going back and forth between weeks which was a shame so at that point it was just really hard i was investing tons of time in this yeah and i was getting just a little aggravated by it and even the the simplistic style i kind of went with which is kind of a throwback to kind of like the annie with the open eyes and stuff that one right. uses was very different than the the very detailed typical comic book illustration i was using for asylum doors and it all happened because i Went on a vacation with the the family over a weekend. Didn't have time to finish that week's strip. So I did this like sad excuse of like stick figure, simple cartoony drawing. Okay. And I threw up there as kind of an apology letter. And that stupid thing did really well. Of course it, it did. One off goofy <laughs> ripping on myself because I'm extremely self-deprecating. And, and it did well. And that's what started that little inkling for kind of twisting it about being myself and kind of having it be a confessional at first. Okay. It's true what Chris says about navigating through a comic on a website. It's obvious what it should do when you're on a website. The problem is it's really difficult to actually make it work. That is flipping from page to page of the comic. When I first started doing my daily comic on the American Bandito site, I didn't have like a next and previous page thing set up. So I finally hunkered down and just figured out a way to set up the next and previous buttons on the site. So after some trial and error, it took me a few hours to do, but I'm glad that I finally figured it out. I actually noticed the change in readership right away. People would actually read several pages at a time then. Chris has currently since published his comic on a different site. Right now I'm associated with uh, Glide Magazine, which is an online music magazine. We have a really good partnership where I have full control over what I'm covering. Oh, you do? And yeah, which, which is key to me. I've had a few different offers come through, one from a, a pretty big company and then a, a, another one from a, a pretty cool punk company as well they kind of came to me but they they really wanted to corral what i was covering and what i was doing and they wanted to dictate who mm. i talked about okay and because i wanted this to be a positive aspect that just didn't work for me business wise probably dumb but creatively it at least keeps me passionate with it all i really care about at this point well here's an interesting question about that if you're writing about these bands can you publish it is there a weird like gray area that's involved here Honestly, it's been really, really pumped up by the bands and the bands really seem to dig it. You know, it, it never came up with the comic with it being an issue because I put the lyrics in there. That, that's really the concern because just talking about it. OK, it's just a review. Put the, the lyrics in the first panel, last panel. Last panel has like a hero shot of the lead singer. As of now, I mean, in it, I've covered everybody from small bands to relatively larger bands. Even the ones I'm covering that are big. I'm not a huge mainstream music fan, so most of them are, are more indie anyway. But it's been really well embraced. And I've actually formed some really solid relationships with some some decent labels too. Formed relationships with Bloodshot Records out of Chicago. Nice. Uh, Epitaph Records. I'm a huge ex-punk kid. Oh. So Epitaph, like that, that was a huge highlight to me. Uh, Fat Records. Um, and gotten on a lot of their lists and they've really supported it and gotten behind it too. So that's awesome. Where I've probably slipped more into a gray area is I do prints of the drawings of the artists I do. I'll actually work their lyrics in, in an artistic way. And that might get more in that gray zone. But so far, again, most of the artists, I've had artists buy prints that I've done of them with their lyrics. Oh, that's really cool. So yeah. And I've had their parents buy stuff. So <laughs> it, it's as of now, I haven't gotten in trouble. That day could come. And if it does, you know, I, I'll face it at that point. But for right now, it's really been loved. And all the support I've gotten from it has really been amazing. On the website for the publication Glide that Chris works for, he's not just a cartoonist. It also says that he's a writer. It's weird. I kind of got pushed into the writing because of the art. Okay. And because of, I, I always wanted to be a comic book artist ever since I was a little kid. And I saw the Rob Liefeld 501 Jeans commercial where I realized people actually draw comics. What? Do you, do you not remember this commercial? No, explain. I bet you I'll, I'll know it when you say uh, it, but I'm trying to picture so, it. 
I found the commercial and I do kind of remember it. So how long have you been drawing comic books? So I was about seven years old, little kid. What did your parents think about it? They hate it. They hate it. Oh, yeah. After I, I got a job and they saw that you can make a living out of third day, you'll hear no complaints anymore. And you created X-Force? Mm -hmm. So what is the drawing on? This is the Spike Man. And what's this right here? This is the camera on top of your head that will record the wrongdoings of others. So Rob, have you had any formal art training? No. Just uh, a lot of imagination, I think. Wait, so, so I say it and then look down? Or just open it and say, fly button? Also, the person interviewing him, that's Spike Lee for some reason. So this would have been probably about 1990, 1991. It was right when, uh, right after he had released X-Force. So like it was the height of the Rob Liefeld era. I guess what happened, the, the story is, as he's told it is, uh, 501 had put out this thing. Hey, we're looking for people in different jobs and things like that and to bring them in into a commercial and to advertise our product. It just so happened that he kind of reached out and there was this Levi's commercial on regular TV about this comic book artist and it showed him drawing and it showed the comics finished and it just, it, it completely absorbed me. And I, I've, huh. I've been into drawing since I was like five, but it was, it was a jeans commercial. It was all about the button fly. It was right when they were really pushing the button fly and it was a comic book artist on regular television, like on primetime TV. It's so nineties. It's not even funny. It's ridiculous, <laughs> but like, it was one of those things um, that it, it just, it blew my mind. Like it was so cool to see, this represented and even though i collected comics and i drew i never put together that somebody actually got paid to create those things so i always wanted to draw but you know you get to a point as an artist especially if you want to do comics where you aren't getting the right material you want you don't have a writer at the time and you're always dependent on somebody else and i've had a few times where I, i've been on cool projects don't get me wrong i i'm an artist so i definitely flake on things as well but like having somebody who you, you come up with these great ideas you start a project and they don't follow through. You're always dependent on that, that mm -hmm. other. So that's why I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to do it. I think I, I've, I, I've started to develop into some type of a writer. I was on my high school newspaper. What I wouldn't count that as any <laughs> real prep for this. I think I have my own voice, which is probably different, but it is unique. And it, it's worked and it started to carry over and it, it's gotten some attention from that. But so, yeah, with Glide, uh, there were certain things that like festivals that they were worried about covering in the comic book form and how to make it work and things like that. So I did some writing originally for some festivals. Riot Fest is a huge festival in Chicago. For me, it worked out perfectly where it was like, OK, I can go and cover this and I can write about it and. You know, I'm not going to lie, covering it and getting in for free is awesome. Oh, of course. So Yeah. yeah. So, so that was what kind of drove me to be like, well, I guess I'll figure out how to write now. And, <laughs> um, it's since changed a bit where I do something different. I cover two music festivals every year. I always cover Riot Fest and I cover this awesome little music fest in Columbia, Missouri. That was where I kind of developed this other way of covering the music festivals because it's hard to do all these panels for it and really represent what's going on. So... What I found, and this is another thing where I just fall into stupid things, I had photo passes. So I was taking photos at these festivals <laughs> too, mainly because I could get really close to the act. Did you have a real camera or were you just using your phone? Years and years ago, I had gotten a old Olympus DLSR. Okay. And so I, I, I have one, but I never really invested in it. I was like, oh, I'll get into this at some point. You know, yeah, I'll one of those things. Yeah. Whatever. Exactly. And, and never really got into it. And so that the first festivals were rough. Cause I mean, this camera, like I didn't have any special lenses. I just had the stock lens it came with uh -huh. everything else. It just kind of started experimenting with it. And so the night shots especially were really kind of iffy. I, I'm kind of one of those people who I'm like, ah, whatever. I'll, I guess I'll try it. Yeah, And so started kind of messing with that. My fiance had uh, like a Canon power glider or some type of decent pocket camera. And so I had that as well and or power shot or something like that. And so I was taking pictures with the, the mixture of the two and was able to get enough to make it work. So I was using the photos I took and then superimposing that goofy cartoon image of myself over it and still using the word bubbles and basically turning it into a, a oh, really? mixed media. Okay. Yeah, and, and personally, I... I think it turned out really cool. And it took a while for me to convince Glide to let me do that with Riot since I was getting the passes to that through them. But last year was the first year I got to do it with Riot. And I think it turned out great. And it got a lot of really good reception and stuff too. Um, I've since invested in better lenses and stuff so I can actually get night shots. I can get a little distance shots. Yeah. 
you know, no, no formal training. So it's really just like take as many pictures as I can and find something decent amongst them. I like the way that each one of your stories starts with, I did this thing, wasn't really sure why, but I was like, I felt like doing it. And then you saw an opportunity and then you take it one step further. You'd be like, oh, let me try that. And it just kind of like branched into several different things. Just trying things to see what shakes out is one of the most intimidating ways to see if you're good at anything. But for me, it also helps me think of different ways to approach things because I don't know the process. I literally have to look at what I'm doing with a fresh set of eyes. So that can also be exciting. Chris still remembers a time from when he was a kid that his dad kind of showed him that way of thinking. My dad was an artist when he was younger, always regretted the fact that he grew up, kind of became an accountant and lost all of his creativity. And he'd always talk about that. So he was the one who pushed the art side of me. Okay. But when I was five years old, I used to color all the time. My dad took all my coloring books away. Okay. And he told me to draw my own pictures and color that. And so this goes into my stubbornness of I hated what I was doing. I still hate what I draw, but I was hating it then. So I just kept doing it mm -hmm. over and over and over again until like all of a sudden people were like, oh, you can draw. Can you do this? Especially in school. Like it was great as a, a kid in grade school. It would get you out of class. Like teacher didn't want to design their board. Hey, can you just draw a poster that I can put up on the board instead? And so I'd get out of English class or some other nonsense. But huh. yeah, it was even even art I stumbled into purely because my dad was like, no, 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 don't just color anymore. Draw your own pictures. To try and promote some of the things that he makes, Chris created a Teespring account. It's one of the many options online to print your own designs on shirts and other items. Kind of like a print on demand that I can kind of set up and kind of explore. And, and I'm getting to that point where, especially with the prints, the... It, the prints are huge. They, they do really well. And I've done exclusive prints. So that, that's been the driving force. And I have some shirts on hand, but that's really the only merch I have on hand. But it's hard because I feel like so much of the comic I need to explain for people to get it, unless a band happens to push it out or a friend brings it up to them. But there, there's a level of understanding of what's being sold to them with it. Yeah. And I've... It, Again, maybe this goes, I had mentioned before, I'm self-deprecating. Maybe it's that lack of faith in myself to actually take that jump. And what made you choose uh, Teespring, just out of curiosity? I, I had just asked some friends, and it actually came up as being a relatively easy one to move okay. your stuff up to. So it was purely ease. It was, okay, I was able to quickly put some things up there and get it out there for people. Okay. And their their payback versus what was out there, the, their, their rates didn't seem as bad. As some others, they, they seemed about on par. So I'm like, okay, I'll just give it a try. Um, I'm always easily convinced to go somewhere else if it's worth it. But so far, it, it's been decent. Yeah, I mean, they're all kind of the same thing. And that's why I was curious with there being so many, if there was a specific reason you chose that one. But you're saying it was word of mouth and you were just like, okay, I'll do that one then. A hundred percent. And they were limited. It's nice to see they're starting to open up what they they'll print on. At first it was pretty limited to mainly like t-shirts and sweatshirts. And that was about it. I'm really hoping they haven't added a hat yet. And again, mm. that that's because I really want one. So I want them to add a hat so that I can get one for myself. If you do end up getting a cart, are there are a bunch of different carts that connect to different services and you can connect them to multiple ones. So you could have your Teespring stuff. I'm just going to throw out an example, even though right now I I'm still looking for one myself, but like Shopify, if you choose that one, you can hook it up to Teespring and you can hook it up to say Art of Nowhere, or you can hook it up to Printful. That way Printful has hats, but you have your Teespring ones. You still have your Teespring store, but you could in take them all into your own cart. And that's how you could compare prices too. So you can go, well, it's cheaper to do t-shirts on this one, but this one offers hats. So I'm going to do it there and you can have them all come into one store. Oh, see, that's, and that's the stuff I actually need to invest some time into. Experience. Yeah. Because that's awesome. And yeah, that that's perfect. Basically, you have your cake and eat it too. You can bring everything kind of together and put and it out there. Then you put it under your own branded cart, but you do have to pay for that cart. Comparatively, out of all of them, to try it out for free is Big Cartel. They'll let you do up to five, but they'll let you okay. ca they'll let you hook it up to other carts that it syncs up with. Problem is, is it only syncs up with like Printful and Art of Nowhere. So like only two okay. carts, but still it lets you try it out. So I've been messing with that. So that's that's why I know about that. And I've only just learned about it like in the past couple of months. So that's why I'm spreading this knowledge on to you. <laughs> no, this is great. First, I want to say I kept saying one of the print-on-demand sites was called Art of Nowhere. It's actually called Art of Wear. But I have to say that these are the kind of discussions I love. When just one little thing can change so much. Because like I said when researching print-on-demand options, it doesn't have to be that I could only pick just one. 
I realized I could pick them all. I just need to see which one of these services connect with the online carts that I'm going to use. Chris said some of the opportunities he had were because people had seen his stuff and reached out. So how did they see it in the first place? When I started, like pretty much the majority of my followers have all come naturally. It's just really word of mouth. Yeah. Oh, I suppose and, you're in publications and stuff though too. So you got a leg up, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So, so that helps. But like, even that as much as I love being a part of glide, like most of my stuff, and I will say the, the biggest benefit I've had is band sharing it. A band really likes it and they share it out there. And you know, it, it helps to varying degrees when I've had larger bands, like, let's say drive by truckers or Lucero share mm -hmm. the ones I've done. I just so happen. I, it, it's, I think it's fair to talk about cause it'll be out tomorrow. Anyway, I'm doing a Craig Finn's new album I'm talking about for oh. tomorrow. So a after we finish recording, I'm going to go finish the comic for that. And oh, that's awesome. Out. But that one, I mean, you get the whole steady following behind his stuff. And yeah. I mean, it goes crazy. So like those things have really brought in a lot of the fans. And I think I've only done two or three, like, actually posts on Facebook where I've put some money into, but I've mm -hmm. never really advertised. I've never done anything. It's just kind of naturally grown. And especially having fans that like music and they're like, nobody's talking about these bands I love. And then by putting something out there and it happens to hit that chord of, Hey, wait, this guy likes the same stuff I do. Yeah. That's what's kind of driven it and kind of helped it grow. It's hard to think of it the way, like you just described the word of mouth thing. It's the same thing for advertising. When you create an advertisement, you're like, what do I say? What's it supposed to be like? And it's like, well, no, you're looking for people that are like the people that found you before. You're just going to them this time. Yep. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to get over that. And it's still, I still struggle with that all the time. And when you find it, you're like, oh, there it is. And well, it's it, the experimentation with that. And the closest I've come to an elevator pitch, which is part of the reason that makes it difficult, is yeah. six panel music blog. Six panels, it, it's a comic that talks about music. That, mm -hmm. That's it. But it's like, there is more than that. And most people are like, oh, it's another music blog. It's almost like I have to put it in front of them for them to actually be like, oh, okay, I, I kind of get it now. So here's the weirdest thing. It's worked for me. It's not easy. It's really annoying uh, to do. But when you get it, it works. So there's this one... I, one, it's a business guy. So it's one of those things where I'm appropriating a business angle and trying to do it more artistically and just because it's business. But it's a guy that basically he... You just write a headline. That's all there is to it. You write a headline, but you write 50 of them. You start writing it as how to do this without doing this. And even if that's not what you're doing, you just start writing that, trying to explain what your comic is or what your selling is. And you write it 50 times and you think about like, who's going to see it as you're writing it. You think about like, who are the people that you actually want to read this and Everything you write is going to be total crap until you start getting to like the 40th one that you're writing and then you'll start getting your own ideas and then you'll start writing your own headline because in advertisement, that's all it is. It's, it's a picture and it's a headline and then it's yep. whether people are going to click or not. But when you hone it down doing it that many times, and that's why I say it's annoying because it takes like an hour. But when you get it, it's worth it. But that's kind of the mastery of art, too. We sit there with art and we're doing things over and over again. I mean, I've been doing this crap now for 35 years and I still hate myself. So, like, <laughs> it's like we're, we're constantly There's your headline. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That would probably do better than it anything else. It actually too. would. Oh, I'm intrigued. Like, what, what does this guy hate that he does? Yeah. So. Also, it's not just writing the headlines out. It's writing them out on paper by hand. It has something to do with muscle memory and connection between your brain and as you're thinking and writing, which I thought was nonsense when I first learned about this, but it really is true. There's just something different in the thought process when I fill a page with headline ideas compared to typing them in a document. I'm sure there's like science involved there somewhere, or maybe I'm just imagining it, but I don't know. I'm not a doctor. So as Chris and I were getting to the end of our conversation, we talked about how moving from Chicago to a suburb had affected what he creates and not in the way that he thought it would. And it kind of reminds me what Maddie Sheets said when I spoke to him previously. One thing I, I've really come to enjoy is finding weird little things since moving out to the suburbs and kind of being away from the city. I always thought like being stuck in the suburbs away from Chicago. I grew up on the South side in the city. I work out in the suburbs and slowly moved further and further out. And now I'm so far out West. The only way I describe it is I live next to Aurora, which everyone knows because of Wayne's world. I'm part of a, like an art collective that's out of Aurora, which does some pretty cool things. Oh, cool. Um, they do first Fridays every month throughout Aurora. And so I'm part of this art collective called art bar. 
The first Friday of every month, we get together and there's an art show at Two Brothers Roundhouse, which you're mixing art and beer, which are two of my favorite things in the world anyway. Right. And so every month is kind of a theme, which which is great. That's always an awesome thing where I will promote to anybody. They, they're they a great group of people, amazing artists. It's very open and, and free and it's a huh. great community to kind of create in. So that's always a, a big thing I'm doing. And you're saying it's a gallery, like people bring their stuff and hang up or they yes. get there and draw or how does that work? So, so what it is, is there's a theme for every month and they, they list it. Basically they do a season and it's from August through June. And then they take July off to kind of recoup. So two brothers roundhouse is actually an old, it's a really, really cool building. It's an old roundhouse where they used to take the trains to work on them because it's right off the train tracks. Mm -hmm. So it's this amazing, great big building. And so they have multiple rooms through it. Well, there's a room that then they'll, they'll give to the, the art community where basically we have walls we put up that we hang up the artwork that represents that theme for that month. You know, they, they, they've gotten some, a lot of good kind of respect in the area and stuff too. And I, I've seen them grow. I've been a part of them for two years now. And it, it, it's, it's a great kind of community to be a part of and, and to kind of push these things that are different. It really was the same excitement about community that just reminded me of when Maddie talked about the drink and draw events that he did. The same kind of community that I was looking for when I started reaching out to all the people I've been meeting on this show. If you want to check out Chris's stuff, you can go to wannabethecomic.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head on over to my site at americanbandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list and find all the links to the different things that I'm on. Or just go there if you have a question or would like to contact me. That's americanbandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening, and until the next episode, so long. <laughs>